afternoon everybody from across the world this is the episode 27 of the virtual bariatric university which i host alongside professor phobi and today we are here with one of the i would say the most stellar of the faculty and speakers you can never have better speakers more knowledgeable more experienced and somebody with more credence to speak about diabetic and metabolic surgery as we have on this panel today our topic today is diabetes metabolic surgery or metabolic surgery for type 2 diabetes is it ready for the prime time i am dr mohit bhandari bariatric metabolic surgeon from indore in india welcome all of you at the outset let me start introduction of the faculty we have today for this course let's start from united states of america we have professor phil shaw i think he needs no introduction everybody knows him but to formally introduce him phil is at the mary k terrell brown hospital and professor of metabolic surgery at the pennington biomedical research center in louisiana at the state university uh dr shaw is one of the most accomplished surgeons we have seen and he is one of the surgeons who started the laparoscopic bariatric procedure in united states of america somebody who entered into the threshold from open to the laparoscopic procedure he was formerly the professor of surgery at the cleveland clinic he was the past president of he is the past president of american society for metabolic and bariatric surgery former chair and founder of obesity week in 2012 co-chair of diabetes surgery summit in 2007 15 and 19 he holds four patents for medical devices and is a founder of minimal invasive surgery symposia which is in its 20th year he has trained more than 200 postgraduate surgeons and 100 fellows in this field he is the past chairman of bariatric surgery section of the the obesity society tos he has been the member of editorial board of the international journal of obesity sword and several other scientific journals more than 400 scientific papers 60 test textbook chapters and many more to his credits welcome professor phil shower to this show and everybody is looking forward to your presentation next we have dr kelvin higa from usa again professor kelvin higa needs no introduction one of the most celebrated one of the most skillful bariatric surgeon board certified in general surgery and is currently the ceo of the advanced laparoscopic surgery associates and serves as the director of minimal invasive and bariatric surgery from fresno heart surgical and 
Heart and Surgical Hospital and as the medical director for diabetes system planning for community medical centers. He's co-director for the Minimally Invasive Bariatric Fellowship Program and holds the academic appointment of the Professor of Surgery and Teaching Residence in the University of California, San Francisco, Fresno program. He served as the president of ASMBS as well as the president of IFSO. He's the recipient of the ASMBS Lifetime Achievement Award and recently the ASMBS Lead Award for the Excellence in Critical Care. Dr. Higa continues to practice general as well as metabolic surgery with more than 25 years of experience in over 10,000 primary and revisional bariatric procedures. His main interest, including bariatric metabolic surgery and advanced laparoscopic technique. He has extensively published in this area and serves on editorial boards of many journals. Welcome Professor Higa to the Virtual Bariatric University. We have Professor David Cummings from US. Dr. Cummings is a professor of medicine in the Division of Metabolism, Endocrinology, and nutrition at the University of Washington, based at the UW Medicine Diabetes Institute and the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System, where he's the director of weight management clinic and program. He studies the endocrine regulation of appetite, body weight, and glucose homeostasis. A major current focus of his research is to elucidate hormonal and metabolic mechanisms, mediating the profound effect of bariatric metabolic surgery through many randomized control trial, which he's continuing and which he's about to publish. He also seeks to clarify the physiologic function of orexigenic hormone ghrelin. He is a recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the highest award conferred by the US government to a researcher in this field. Giving a lecture today, 15 received minutes. The 1996 <laughs> Athens Sims Virtual Young Investigator University. Award for the TOS. He is the honorary professor. He was awarded the honorary professor in 2017 from Sims Medical College and Postgraduate Institute here in India. Welcome, Professor Cummings. Next from Brazil, Dr. Aurio de Paula, another talented and very skillful surgeon. He's a pioneer of ileal interposition surgery, he has done thousands of ileal interposition surgeries to his credit in last decade. Uh, before starting the ileal transposition, he was an authority in trans hiatal esophagectomies for Chagas disease. He's a member of the Brazilian College of Digestive Surgery, Brazilian College of Surgeons, Bra Brazilian College of Digestive Endoscopy, and American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeons. Aureo, welcome to the show. We have had you before in another meeting in the Virtual Bariatric University, but today I think you are one of the appropriate speakers to speak about metabolic and diabetes surgery, and even on low BMI diabetics. We have Professor Francesco Rubino from United Kingdom, and Francesco, as everybody knows, is one of those leaders who have done so much good to the society by bringing the name, the term metabolic surgery and diabetes surgery, and by even going beyond and bringing the physicians on board by making them understand that metabolic surgery should find its place in the algorithm for treating type two diabetes. Francesco is a chair of metabolic bariatric surgery at the King's College London. His clinical expertise includes laparoscopic bariatric metabolic and upper digestive surgery. He's internationally recognized as one of the world leader in research, teaching and practice of metabolic diabetes weight loss surgery. Recipient of numerous awards, more than 100 presentations and author of more than 100 articles and book chapters. One of the co-organizers, of the landmark Diabetes Surgery Summit, which I'm mentioning, which have been conducting these meetings all across the world. He also served as the Congress Director and organized the first and the second World Congress for interventional therapies for type two diabetes in New York City, bringing together over 1000 multidisciplinary diabetes experts from 62 countries. For several consecutive years, Professor Rubino was selected by both US News and World Report and Castle Connolly as one of the America's top doctors and was selected by Crane's New York business as notable 40 under 40. His work has been featured in journals such as New York Times, The Wall Street, The Newsweek, 60 Minutes on CBS, The Guardian, and many others, including the newspapers, not only in US or UK, but in Japan, Italy, Qatar, Brazil, South Africa, and the list is endless. Welcome, Professor Francesco. You are one of the main ingredients today of this fantastic virtual bariatric university meeting 
on diabetes surgery, which has been organized by Professor Phoebe and myself. And without you, this meeting would have been incomplete. Thank you so very much for taking out the time. We have Professor Michel Suter from Switzerland, another authority in this field. Professor Michel Suter is specialist in general surgery, in visceral surgery and head of surgery in department of Gabelli's Hospital in Monthe, assistant physician in visceral surgery in department of Vaudois University Hospital in Lausanne. He organized the fourth Congress of European chapter in Ipswich in 2010 and was the president of Swiss Society for the Study of Morbid Obesity and Metabolic Disorders between 2010 and 2014. He was the president of IFSO European chapter for 2016 to 2018. He's currently the vice president of the IFSO scientific committee. Published several articles on various aspects of bariatric surgery and also the advising editor for Journal of Obesity Surgery. We have from India, Professor Sachin Chitavar, one of the friends we have. He did his fellowship in endocrinology from All India Institute of Medical Sciences from New Delhi. He's a director of Harmony Super Special Speciality Clinic. He's an ex-associate professor at the GMC Medical College in Bhopal, more than 30 publication in index journals, faculty in national and international conferences, and course coordinator for PFHI and several other educational programs. I would say this forum today is a very balanced forum with surgeons and endocrinologists like Dr. Cummings and Dr. Chittawar. And all of us here are about to discuss about the next new thing, the metabolic surgery to type two diabetes. Once again, a warm welcome from me and Professor Phoebe uh, from Indore here in India. And without too much of formalities now, I would like to kickstart the program by inviting Professor Cummings to present in lect his lecture and Dr. Sachin Chittawar, Michelle Suter, and Dr. Higa to moderate the lecture session. Dr. Cummings, please. The task initially assigned to me of summarizing diabetes medical care is frankly too much for 15 minutes. So what I'm going to do is cover a few key highlights and one particularly new development and especially focus on how these impact the field of metabolic surgery. Now, when I was in medical school, the answer to this question was not known. Does type glycemic control matter for reducing diabetes complications? Of course, we think of that as an axiomatic answer now, but there, it had never been tried in a randomized controlled trial. Fortunately, in the intervening years, that answer has been made by two of the most landmark studies in all of diabetology. It was addressed in type 1 diabetes with the DCCT EDIC study and in type 2 with the UK PDS study. Both were randomized trials that allocated people into either intensive glycemic control or standard control, and they both had very similar findings. In both cases, it was found that intensive glycemic control did reduce diabetes microvascular complications. That's retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. But in neither case were they able to find during the course of the trial that there was a reduction in macrovascular complications, meaning heart attacks and strokes. However, in both cases, if the study cohorts were followed many years later, it was found that a period of prior type glycemic control does yield later reductions in macrovascular events, an effect called the legacy effect. And these trials laid the, ground, the foundation for modern diabetology and fueled the multi-billion dollar industry of an ever increasing plethora and distribution of glucose lowering agents. Now in that development, another important punctuation mark came with this paper by Dr. Steve Netton Nissen and Kathy Wolskin. Published in the New England Journal, it was a meta-analysis that seemed to show that the then diabetes medication rosiglitazone actually caused more heart attacks and strokes and single-handedly el eliminated that medicine from our armamentarium. More importantly, however, it changed FDA regulations for the requirements needed by any medicine that is trying to be marketed for diabetes. And it said that any new diabetes medication has to be the subject of a hard cardiovascular outcome trial to show that at least it's not inferior to placebo for causing heart attacks and strokes. And although that induced, introduced a major regulatory barrier for new agents, it has produced a great amount of science. So now we have lots of cardiovascular outcome trials, despite how hard and difficult they are, 
for all the newer agents. And moreover, in two cases, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, they were found actually to reduce heart attacks and strokes during the period of the actual interventions. Or there are, I should say they were found to reduce cardiovascular events during the course of the original trials. And that had never been shown for any diabetes medication previously. So it has now become the case that if you want your new agent to appear in this all important treatment algorithm for caring for diabetes that gets put out every year by the ADA and guides care throughout the world, you have to subject that intervention to a cardiovascular outcome trial. That's important for metabolic surgery because in my opinion, this is the standard for diabetes medical care and the diabetes community is going to expect it for metabolic surgery as well if we wanna ever increase the penetrance of metabolic surgery that's now paltry. Now the biggest recent news in diabetes uh, pertaining to a diabetes medication actually pertains to weight loss. Weight loss in the past was achievable through six classes of prescription weight loss drugs. Not long ago, one of them dropped out for side effects. So we now have five classes and they cause some weight loss. Here's a summary of some of them. The black shows you the drug induced weight loss at a year versus the placebo weight loss. And overall in general, prescription weight loss drugs cause a placebo subtracted weight loss of about three to 8%. It's significant, it's important, but it's you know, not exactly earth shaking. That's the way everything was in the world until June 4th, 2021. And on that day, the FDA made a new announcement that hit the news and lots of stories came out with big headlines about a new drug sold by Minova Nordisk. And the ABC story started with the following words, which I do not think are hyperbole. A new weight loss treatment is being heralded by some experts as quote, groundbreaking and a potential quote, game changer in the growing epidemic of obesity. What we're talking about here is the GLP-1 receptor ag agonist semaglutide, previously used only for diabetes and now newly approved by FDA as a treatment for obesity alone and at a higher dose. All this change resulted from a series of randomized trials called the STEP trials. STEP stands for semaglutide treatment effect in people, but it has a double meaning. Step one, two, three, and four were all published in the last few months at the very top level journals. There's also a series of additional steps that are underway. There's one in teens, a couple in heart failure uh, and others. And most importantly, this one, the SELECT trial down below is a hard cardiovascular outcomes trial in people without diabetes, the largest trial ever sponsored by Novo Nordisk. And it's going to try to determine whether semaglutide at this new high dose can actually reduce cardiovascular outcomes through weight loss, something that has never been demonstrated with any prior weight loss drug or intervention. I'll just quickly touch on two of these trials and their highlights. Step one was a randomized trial published in the New England Journal earlier this year, studying randomly semaglutide at the high dose versus placebo. And because the, GI, the, the side effects of semaglutide, which are all in the GI domain, are minimized by going slowly, you up titrate this over a period of some months in a step-like manner, hence the other meaning for step. This is the core finding. In nearly 2000 patients randomly allocated to placebo or semaglutide, the semaglutide induced placebo subtracted weight loss was more like 14 or 15%. That's two to three times higher than anything we've ever seen with a prior weight loss drug. Looking at it a different way in terms of categorical weight loss, a stunning 55% of people lost at least 15% of their body weight, and 35% of people lost at least 20% of their body weight. That's something like we've never seen before. Results were even a little bit better with step three, which is the same kind of trial in people without diabetes, randomly allocated to placebo or, or, or semaglutide, and everybody got an intensive medical regimen, I'm sorry, a lifestyle regimen. So the weight loss is a little bit more even now, 16% on average, Categorically, 56% of people on semaglutide achieved at least 15% of body weight and 36% achieved at least 20% body weight loss. So finally, we've got something that fills what we call the therapeutic gap. So for a long time, we've had agents that are not very invasive like lifestyle and meds, but they're not very effective. Or we've had other things that are very invasive like metabolic surgery, but it's very effective, but very invasive. And then there's this, been this gap in the middle. This is the first time with semaglutide at higher dose, we've got a drug that really fits right about in the middle, halfway between the weight loss of the other agents and surgery. 
So how does this actually compare with metabolic surgery? Although semaglutide is quite stunning, it is still far inferior to metabolic surgery for weight loss and other things. The weight loss is expected with metabolic surgery is more like 30 or 35%. Also, these operations are just terrific against diabetes, causing remission in most cases, both through engagement, both through secondary consequences of weight loss and engagement of multiple weight independent effects on diabetes. There are now 12 randomized controlled trials directly competing surgical versus non-surgical approaches to diabetes that have all shown various different metabolic operations to be superior to any known med uh, medical lifestyle intervention for glycemic control. We can now say from the rather universal findings of these 12 randomized trials that metabolic bariatric surgery is more effective than lifestyle medical, medical intervention for weight loss, glycemic control, especially diabetes remission, other improvements in cardiovascular risk factors with acceptable complications for up to 10 years and with similar results above or below a BMI starting at 35. So that's great. That's really cool for glycemic control. The trouble is glycemic control is a surrogate endpoint. Very few people actually die from too high blood sugar per se. They die from the consequences on end organs of running their blood sugars high for many decades. Now, in primarily non-randomized trials, metabolic surgery has been shown to be associated with reductions in diabetes microvascular events, that's more than 12 different studies, and macrovascular events in more than 10 different studies. What about this question? To my mind, this is the most important one for the patient contemplating surgery. Am I likely to live longer if I do or do not have metabolic surgery? And to address that, I'd like to present some brand new data from a paper I studied, a, a paper I published a couple of months ago with a team of investigators in the journal Lancet. So this is a, an evaluation of the association of metabolic surgery with long-term all-cause mortality. As I mentioned, it was published in the Lancet in May. I'm the co-first author or shared first author, but I wanna shout out quickly to the guy who's actually listed first, Nicholas Sin. He's a brilliant young scientist I'm sure we'll be hearing more from, as well as my dear friend, Asim Shabir, the senior author. In this, we did a, long, a longevity meta-analysis, I must say rather rigorous, using individual patient level survival data reconstructed from prospective control trials and high quality matched cohort studies, all of which directly compared people who underwent metabolic surgery or did not, and importantly, were beautifully well matched at baseline. This PRISMA acquisition diagram shows how we moved from a large number of potential candidate publications to analyze, and then imposed upon them strict quality control regimens that were pre-described to get us down to finally 17 studies that met our standards. Most of them were quite new, all but two published since 2016. In total, they encompassed almost 175,000 subjects with 1.2 million years of patient follow-up. This is the core finding, the cumulative all-cause mortality among people who either underwent metabolic surgery in the blue or did not in the orange, and importantly, were exquisitely well-matched at baseline for everything you could care about in this kind of a study. You can see that those who underwent surgery enjoyed a mortality benefit and that was detectable statistically as early as one year, and then just got bigger and bigger and bigger for as many as 30 years. Summarizing these results in simple take-home words, compared to matched non-surgical controls, metabolic surgery was associated with a reduction in the hazard rate of death by 49.2%, and an increase in the median life expectancy of 6.1 years. We did some subgroup analyses. This is the most important one, dividing people into those who started with diabetes or not. And those with diabetes enjoyed a greater survival benefit from surgery than those without. Summarizing that in words, again, compared to matched non-surgical controls, metabolic surgery decreased the hazard rate of death by 59.1% in people with diabetes and only 29.6% in people without diabetes. Surgery was associated in the, with an increase in the median life expectancy of a, a whopping 9.3 years among people with diabetes and a respectable 5.1 years among those without. In terms of the numbers needed to treat with surgery to prevent one death over 10 years, that number was a mere eight among people with diabetes and 30 without diabetes. Now, those are both very respectable effect sizes for a number needed to treat data, but this shows you particularly how much greater the survival benefit is with metabolic surgery among people with diabetes. 
Another subgroup analysis was to examine individually each of the different operations performed most commonly over this period. And we found that each individually conferred a survival benefit over the non-surgical matched controls in those studies. This shows the 17 individual studies that met our quality control criteria. Each individually showed a survival benefit of metabolic surgery compared to matched non-surgical controls, except one. And that one was a specialty case shown in the kind of the middle of Heisinger, Heisinger. That was a study of the safety of metabolic surgery only in elderly patients. So presumably they just didn't have enough time to show a survival benefit of surgery in that one study. This is a little trouble tough of a graph to get your mind around, but what it shows is the estimated increase in, in life years worldwide for every 1% increase in metabolic surgery usage. So to put this, and then the two X axes are with and without diabetes. To put this in words that are easy to understand, we estimate that with each 1% increase in the actual utilization of metabolic surgery among qualified candidates, about 12 million potential life years of, would be saved worldwide. So in most industrialized nations, the actual use of metabolic surgery among qualified candidates runs a little less than 1%. If we were to increase that to a little bit less than 2%, we estimate that about 12 million people would be saved every year. I wanna highlight a major limitation in all of this, a potentially unmeasured confounder pertaining to motivation. Because most of the studies we analyzed were not randomized trials, it is possible that the people who elected to have metabolic surgery were by doing that, declaring themselves motivated to get a grip on their health in general. Maybe somebody motivated enough to undergo a major operation is also more likely to see his doctor and start taking medicines more rigorously and start running and stopping smoking and stuff, things like that. Very, very difficult to match for that kind of behavioral paradigm, especially since it's behavior in the future after the matching. So I maintain that we still need a randomized trial of surgical versus medical lifestyle approaches to diabetes that's big enough and long enough to be powered to see hard cardiovascular and maybe cancer outcomes. Not only because it's scientifically called for, but because it's politically mandated by the fact that the diabetes community is used to these CBOTs for their diabetes new medications. I've had the pleasure of working with many talented individuals at the University of Washington over my career, as well as cherished colleagues elsewhere. Most of the ones listed here are the co-authors of that Lancet paper, as well as the main architects of the Diabetes Surgery Summit series of objectives some of which provided the data I've shown here. I thank all of them for their hard work and all of you for your attention. Sakin. I think uh, Dr. Chittavar has joined us. Can you hear us, Dr. Sachin? Okay, I'll, I'll, ask a, I'll ask a question till the time Dr. Sachin is joining. I think he has joined, but his voice is not, not clear. Can you hear us, Dr. Sachin? Nice, go ahead. Okay, so uh, Dr. Cummings, as usual, it was very lucid to listen to you always, very insightful, and uh, most of your slides should be used probably by metabolic surgeons to you know rope in more patients, give more confidence. And obviously your slides are backed by a lot of data. My, my first question to you is that, uh, uh, I, I know that you, you run a weight loss clinics and, and, and then you refer those patients as a part of your algorithm. Uh, uh, what, are, what are those drugs uh, which you regularly use in your practice uh, on, on patients who are you know, between a BMI of 25 to 35 and who are type two diabetic mostly for their for the treatment of their metabolic syndrome and and why you the why you use these drugs and what's your personal preference on them um mohit by far my favorite drug for that kind of person is semaglutide and I'm, i work at a va hospital a veterans administration hospital and for some sort of specialized backdoor reason we've been able to use semaglutide for people uh looking for weight loss alone, even without diabetes for about two years. Now that was off label use. It was not actually prescribed. It's not FDA approved for that until June 4th of this year, but now we can do it on label according to you know, the, what the FDA approves. Uh, we happen to have Ozempic brand. We don't yet have Wegovy brand. The one that is approved by the FDA for weight loss alone is actually a Wegovy. It's called Wegovy as the brand name, but 
Wegovy and Ozempic are the exact same drug um, sold by the same company. They're both, it's just a marketing technique to brand them differently. So I feel perfectly comfortable using Ozempic for weight loss alone at up to higher doses. So it's deliverable up to two milligrams a week. Um, Wegovy goes up to 2.4 milligrams a week. The previous doses used for diabetes maxed out at one milligram per week. I also have access to all the other FDA approved weight loss medicines. And depending on the selected patient, I may, I might use Contrave or Qsimia, um, sometimes occasionally just Fentamine by itself. I almost never use um, Orlistat because it's got such terrible side effects, um, but we, we have access to all of them. Um, but for sure, I, if, I, if, I had, you know, if I had only one to use, I would use some Agotide all the time. It's got you know, two to three times more weight loss than any other drug and it's really good for diabetes. In question to you would be now, we have oral semaglutide available and uh, here in India, Nova Novartis is going in a big way to bariatric surgeons talking about the oral semaglutide. And I don't know whether Dr. Higa or Professor Michel Suter or Phil has used oral semaglutide in their practice, but uh, I used oral semaglutide through patient appeal process here where we can get these drugs, even if they are not approved in the country. Uh, I have some good data on that, but I want to, I want to hear it from you. In comparison to, because oral semaglutide has more compliance for Indian patients and uh, most patients are not, they think that if they, uh, they use this, uh, they're better off with insulin. So what is the difference? 14 milligram oral semaglutide versus 2.5 milligram of injectable semaglutide. How, how are you seeing? Is there a difference or do you still recommend? And I'm specifically asking for the treatment of obesity and not diabetes. So the two have not been directly compared head to head injectable versus oral semaglutide. So we, we can't make any conclusions from direct data of the relative efficacy of one or the other. And I can't tell you my personal experience because we don't have oral semaglutide here. So I, I just have never had access to it. Um, it is a reasonable question. Would, as a patient, would you rather take a pill every day or would you rather take a shot every week? The semaglutide is pretty damn easy. It, it's a, a little tiny pen, a very small needle. People you know, barely feel it and they'll have to do it once a week. It's quite easy. I might say that's e easier than remembering to take a pill every day, but it's a patient choice. Some people have needle phobia and even a small needle is a problem. So for them, the oral formulation would be better if you can get it. Okay, great. The last question which I have for you is, uh, we are doing a lot of bariatric endoscopic procedure these days, uh, and we are treating weight recidivism with endoscopic methods and uh, Manuel is here in India now. So we've, we are doing some workshops and trying to treat sleeve weight failures and even Ruawai gastric bypass by endoscopic procedures. Uh, do you have any data on treating uh, weight recidivism with medical management or in combination with endoscopy. And how do you think uh, weight re recidivism in your weight loss clinics for patients who, who failed bariatric surgery? Very good question, Mohit. Uh, there's only one randomized trial I'm aware of that is directly compared uh, placebo versus a, a medical management in people who've had metabolic surgery. It's the Gravitas trial published by Alex Maras at Imperial College London. And it was a randomized trial about people who had undergone gastric bypass and once had diabetes. And at this time were either had, uh, had the, re the diabetes recur, remit, you know, remit and then relapse, or it never went into remission in the first place. And those who were allocated to get additional liraglutide had better outcomes than those with placebo for both weight loss and diabetes. I, was, I didn't expect that result, frankly. I told Alex I, didn't, I think he'd have a negative result because the endogenous GLP-1 augmentation after gastric bypass is somewhere between 15 and 30 fold compared to the same meals, you know, if you did the same test meal before surgery. And if you got 30 fold increase in your endogenous GLP-1, which is not only a huge amount, but also synthesized from the correct site of normal secretion in the L cells where it's poised to not only engage humoral, but the important neural mechanisms. I didn't think adding a little bit of extra systemic laragotide would do anything, but I was proven wrong. So in that particular case, adding a medicine to surgery augments the effects of surgery. And I would suggest that probably other, other weight loss medicines will do the same, especially the weight loss medicines that act through mechanisms that are not engaged by surgery. So like SGL, uh, you know, most of them actually don't replicate the things we do with surgery. So they should have an additive effect. 
it's a very unexplored te uh, terrain to determine with series of randomized trials whether that's true or not. If you take you know gastric bypass and add contract to it or add Qsimia to it and so on, but that needs to be done. One, uh, yeah, Doctor, I, I would invite Professor Higa to introduce Dr. Phil Shower, and then we have his lecture. Dr. Higa, please. Well, it, 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 uh, there's not much more that can be said about Phil that you've already has said, Mohi, but um, <laughs> I'll have to say that um, it is, for me, it is an honor to introduce Phil, uh, not only because he's a good friend, but because of the things that don't go on his CV. Phil is, uh, is not just an innovator, but a collaborator, and, collaborator, and, and uh, he has brought together, as you mentioned, all aspects of the treatment of this disease. Uh, he was the instigator of changing the name of, ASM, of ASBS to ASMBS, and uh, of course, putting together Obesity Week and bringing together uh, uh, medical uh, experts uh, as well. Um, and so in that way, uh, we owe uh, a great debt of uh, uh, gratitude to Phil for all his uh, work. Phil? Uh, I know you're in the OR, but uh, anxious to hear your lecture. Our professor of metabolic surgery at Pennington Biomedical Research Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm very pleased to join this session of Virtual Bariatric University about outcomes of type 2 diabetes for metabolic procedures. I do want to thank uh, Dr. Mal Foby and Dr. Mohan for the invitation to participate in this very important discussion today. These are my disclosures. I don't believe any of these have any uh, significant conflict with uh, my presentation. So here we are in 2021 with the four common uh, bariatric uh, procedures performed throughout the world. Uh, approximately 90% of the operations are either sleeve gastrectomy or some form of gastric bypass, either the Ruin Y construction or the uh, loop bypass. And the gastric band is much less common, as well as the other malabsorption procedures like duodenal switch and uh, the SADI procedure. I'll talk briefly about the variations of the gastric bypass, like the uh, single anastomosis gastric bypass, because it does have slightly different diabetes outcomes, uh, as well as uh, the SADI procedure later on in the presentation. Let's first go to the uh, prospective randomized controlled trials. And we now have over 12 randomized controlled trials comparing various types of metabolic surgery with medical treatment. These include gastric bypass, gastric banding, and sleeve gastrectomy. I wanna focus on uh, the uh, Stampede trial because it does compare the two most common operations, gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. This graph shows you the change in A1C over the five-year period between the medical gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy groups. You can see that gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy are virtually the same. Now it's important to note that this study wasn't powered sufficiently to detect small but clinically significant differences between gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. But note, at the end of five years, overall, the surgical patients did much better than the medical patients. And there was a non-statistically significant difference favoring gastric bypass over sleeve gastrectomy in terms of remission. But it's also important to look not only at A1C changes or remission, but also the medication required to achieve those levels. And here in the Stampede trial, you can see that while the gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy achieve similar changes in A1C, patients with the gastric bypass required far fewer medications to achieve that endpoint. So medication usage is another important endpoint for any procedure assessing 
you know, outcomes of type two diabetes. Now there are other small randomized controlled trials comparing sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass in addition to Stampede, including the sleeve pass study, the SM Boss study, and a study by Ruiz Tofar. And here's a very nice review of those studies published just last year by Dr. Minion. And again, these studies were relatively small and they weren't really powered sufficiently to look specifically at diabetes outcomes between uh, these two procedures. And you can see here, the p-values are not statistically significant comparing the remission rates of these two procedures. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no difference. It just means that these studies were not powered sufficiently to detect a difference. Let's go to another study that was specifically designed to compare sleeve gastrectomy versus gastric bypass for diabetes remission. This is a study out of Norway, published just a couple of years ago, a very well designed study. And this is the remission rate outcome at one year or 52 weeks. And you can see that patients who had gastric bypass had nearly 80% remission, whereas those who had sleep gastrectomy had about a 50% remission. This was a highly statistically significant difference. And when they looked at medication usage as well, they saw a similar pattern that was noted in the stampede trial. Patients who had gastric bypass had a much higher probability of reducing their medication dependency. So this is probably the best study comparing sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass head to head for diabetes outcomes. Now, what about the larger observational studies? Because they are much more powered to show differences between these operations and can show longer follow-up. And one of the best studies is this study from the PCORNET network that evaluates nearly 10,000 patients over five years who had sleeve gastrectomy or gastric bypass. And remember, this is not a prospective randomized controlled trial, but the two groups were matched fairly well. And you can see on the left that gastric bypass had greater weight loss than sleeve gastrectomy. But on the right, more importantly, it shows the differences in A1C improvement. And here there was clearly a statistically significant benefit of gastric bypass over sleeve gastrectomy in terms of change in A1C. So with this very large study of nearly 10,000, this is pretty significant uh, in terms of differentiating the bypass and sleeve gastrectomy for diabetes. Now, in our own group, when I was in Cleveland, we looked at a sample of nearly uh, 900 patients with five-year follow-up from the Cleveland Clinic cohort and also a cohort from Barcelona, Spain. And all these patients had diabetes. We were able to separate them into mild, moderate, or severe diabetes based on their individualized metabolic surgery score. And what we found was that in these different cohorts, those that had moderate disease, you see a big difference both in the Cleveland cohort and the Barcelona cohort, where the gastric bypass has a significantly greater remission rate than the sleeve, gastric, uh, sleeve gastrectomy. And these differences were highly statistically significant. These differences were not so apparent in those that had mild disease, where most patients have a remission. And certainly for severe disease, both operations are much less likely to achieve remission. So perhaps the sweet spot here for gastric bypass is in patients with moderate diabetes, that is five years or longer, between five and 10 year uh, diabetes duration. Now, what about gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy in terms of the cardiovascular outcomes? Well, there's quite a few studies, in fact, nearly 30 large observational studies published in pretty high-end journals uh, including one of our own studies from Cleveland and the SOS study. But these studies um, have 
an insufficient number of sleeve gastrectomies to really show any type of difference in terms of cardiovascular outcomes. We don't really have the data to really make those inferences uh, at the present time. And what about other procedures? The single anastomosis gastric bypass, duodenal switch, and SADI. Well, here's a nice uh, nearly 20-year follow-up study from the group in Taiwan looking at diabetes outcomes for the single anastomosis gastric bypass. And they point out that they have modified the procedure over this 20 year period, adjusting the various BP limb and common channel lengths. But nevertheless, the results are quite impressive, noting that at the 15 year mark, they're showing greater than 65% uh, complete or partial remission in these patients with diabetes. So that's quite impressive, especially during this long-term follow-up period. But please note that these are patients from Taiwan who may be different than other populations in the, in the world. And their mean BMI was around 40, so a bit smaller than other studies. And then here is a study from Mangroni and Rubino looking at the BPD procedure with 10-year follow-up randomized prospective study, BPD had 50% remission rate compared to about 35% for gastric bypass. That number was statistically significant. And, and the A1C changes also favored uh, BPD over gastric bypass, but the difference here um, was fairly small, maybe less clinically significant, but, but clearly the BPD appears to be more effective than the bypass long-term in terms of glycemic uh, control. And then finally, this is data from Antonio Torres, five-year results of the SADI procedure showing overall remission rates at five years in three different subpopulations, those on insulin, 47%, uh, those on oral agents only, nearly 90% at five years, quite impressive. And then the total population, 72%. So this is quite impressive, impressive. But note that this is a fairly small study. Only around 30 or so patients were available for follow-up at five years. And this has not been validated by other groups as of yet. But nevertheless, still quite uh, impressive. So in summary, we have a number of, of metabolic bariatric procedures that are quite effective in achieving long-term glycemic control, and even remission. And this sort of shows you that those with fairly early disease, all these operations are quite effective when there's very good beta cell function. More advanced disease, this is where the operations tend to separate. The malabsorption procedures like DS and single anastomosis bypass and SADI tend to have a greater improvement in glycemic control compared to the others. However, you do pay a price in terms of increased nutrient deficiencies with these malabsorption operations. When you compare the most common procedures, BPD and, I'm sorry, gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy, the data does suggest that the gastric bypass is superior in terms of long-term glycemic control and remission with comparable uh, risks overall in terms of major complications. Finally, I do want to invite all of you to another um, educational seminar known as Metabolic Surgery Grand Rounds. It takes place once a month. Our last one was July 1st. pbgrounds.org is our website. Our last one showcased important landmark studies published this spring in 2021. Next month, we're featuring Antonio Torres speaking about the SADI procedure and long-term results. So please join us, pbgrandrounds.org. Thank you very much for your attention. I think, thanks, uh, Phil. Phil, are you online now? Are you um, able to, to uh, talk to us? Phil is in the operating room and... Um, Hopefully he can break away. Hey, Calvin, can you hear me? 
Yeah, we can hear you. Hey, it's good to see you operating now. That's great. Again. Yeah, listen, Kelvin, while you guys are talking about curing diabetes, I'm doing it. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, we hope so. Hey, okay. Phil, I've got a couple questions. Got a couple questions for you. Um, first of all, when do you think the BMI criteria for surgery is going to go away? I mean, uh, do you or do you think it ever will? Well, I think before it goes away, Kelvin, we should steadily lower it. We should lower it based on the available data that supports it, okay? So I think we're already there down with diabetes to a BMI of 30. I think we're already there. And you know, some of those studies that have the lower BMI, like Stampede, for example, do go down as low as 27. I think the gap, Kelvin, is 25 to 30, where we don't have much data. Now, uh, the paper by David Cummings and the group in India, you know, did cover that 25 to 30 range and saw pretty good efficacy and safety there. But that has not been validated, to my knowledge, by any other study. So I think we get rid of it, Kelvin, by sequentially doing the studies in these lower BMI ranges that provide efficacy and safety. Now, you know, despite a, uh, our claim to be metabolic surgeons, in a way, if you look at uh, MBSA web data, it's really a minority of patients that actually have diabetes, not, not talking about the potential, but, I, but a minority that has uh, diabetes. Now, with the newer medications, the oral semaglutide, that are becoming more and more effective. It's really outstanding and that's really fantastic. But um, I can see that similar to the cardiovascular world that our patients are gonna be pushed more and more to uh, higher risk, higher levels of disease, uh, which you've already studied in Stampede, of course, but uh, that is going to affect our outcomes. And I think we have to up our game, but don't you, think that uh, we're going to be uh, operating on uh, uh, the sicker patients, the ones that actually fail medical management, that's becoming better and better as time goes on? Um, well, yeah, certainly, certainly. However, Kelvin, you know, and, and, and I'm very pleased with these new potential drugs coming on board, you know, but, but they've not been studied adequately and and they need, you know, we need longer follow-up. But remember, surgery is the only thing that's been shown to cause long-term remission of diabetes. It's the only therapy. You know, Francesco and Gilles Trude just published, you know, 10-year follow-up of the randomized controlled trial showing between 30 and 40% were in complete remission remission of diabetes, okay? Semagotide will never cause remission. And semagotide will never stand by itself. It's always got to have other drugs, all this polypharmacy and the cost associated and the drug to drug interactions and the compliance issues. So I think there'll always be room for surgery. And if we convince our endocrinology colleagues to refer the patient sooner, we can preserve their beta cell function their entire life. Spoken like a true surgeon, but <laughs> as, Calvin, but as also, a patient, don't you as think currently that, priced semaglutide? Yeah. Well, you don't need to take two or three years of it to make the cost of surgery. It's you know In about two years. The semaglutide equals one gastric bypass. Go ahead, Kelvin. Depends if you're in Fresno or if you're in Cleveland or something, but. Okay, so, but don't you think we're entering an era now where, where combination therapy uh, is, is going to be sort of the norm? I mean, uh, oh, absolutely, it already is. is. Yeah, right? I mean, but you know, it you already I is. Know the bypass may be the most effective, but you have a sleeve plus semaglutide plus uh, statin plus this. I mean, it would be, uh, sure. I think, eat yourself, right? Sure. Right. I mean, you know, Stampede, most of those patients were on medications, but most of the patients who had surgery reduced their medications. There is some value in 
reducing dependency on medications that our endocrinology colleagues don't seem to appreciate. I wonder why, okay? But reducing medications is a good thing. But when you do need them to augment the effect of surgery, to get to the A1C targets, LDL cholesterol, blood pressure, of course. And of course the ever, ever most important, the, the cardiovascular endpoints as David had talked to. Well, thank you very much. Is, uh, I'll open up, right. is there other questions from the group? Or Phil? Well, Kevin, yeah, one other thing I think it's really important for our surgical community to recognize the incredible accomplishments in reducing complications, you know, all across the globe. You know, Kelvin, when you and I started back in the dinosaur era, you know, mortality rates were about 1%. And they have dropped tenfold to 0 0.1 for these procedures, you know, Gastric bypass has the same risk as a gallbladder operation, but look what we're getting for it. You're getting a lifetime of metabolic effect. I mean, it's a bargain, and we surgeons, you know, need to constantly remind our medical colleagues about this long-term, lifelong effect of surgery that's relatively safe. Hey, you don't have to tell me on it. I've already, I'm already sold. I'm good with that. <laughs> Kelvin. Can I uh, make a point about your first question? This is David, sure. about the BMI criteria. There was a paper published two or three months ago in Lancet Diabetes that studied a great number okay. of people, various different ethnic groups. <laughs> and it said, what is the equivalent risk for diabetes development among various races as that of a person of Caucasian descent with a BMI of 30? And the answer was, for the same diabetes risk, blacks would be, have a BMI of 28, Arabs 26, East Asians, 24 or five, South Asians, 23, Bangladeshis, 21. And <laughs> so th those are all the equivalent risks for diabetes development. And it, I just want to point out that worldwide, even a BMI of 30 as a cutoff is still pretty high. And most people in the world with diabetes have BMIs much lower than that. Good point. That's a, I, I mean, it clearly, uh, the, even the, the BMI is, is, a, is a poor, measure of Kelvin, yeah I, I gotta get back to surgery the, the beta cells are calling me okay the beta okay. cells want to get better so i have to go back and cure this patient okay hey thank go, go, go see some life Phil. thank you thank you very much okay i love you guys <laughs> love you guys Mwah. Bye, Phil. Mwah. Mwah. bye wash your hands Phil. wash your hands okay michelle michelle can you hear me? Dr. Sutter? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I invite Mario uh, to give his talk. Okay. I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Forby and uh, Dr. Baderi for inviting me to participate in this. Uh, virtual Maratic University. Um, I have to apologize for the connection, which is very poor. It's due to technical issues with my computer. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aurel de Paula from Brazil, who's going to talk about the role of uh, ileal interposition in non-obese patients. And that maybe will answer some of the questions asked just before. Is ileal interposition position a viable option in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Dr. De Paula is head of Department of Surgery of the Hospital of the Especialidades Guayana in Goiás, Brazil. He's one of the world pioneer for ileal transposition surgery, which is also called small intestinal switch to control and cure diabetes. And he has performed several hundreds, if not thousands of those procedures over the last decade with very much safety and uh, so far as I know, excellent results. I'm very excited to, to, to hear his results. Please, Aria, welcome. Diabetic metabolic surgery, is it ready for prime time? 
Uh, I'd like to thank the Virtual Bariatric University and especially Dr. Bandari and Dr. Fabi for the opportunity to participate in this meeting with the, the topic ileum interposition in non-obese patients. Is it a viable option in the treatment of uh, type 2 diabetes? I have nothing to disclose in relation to this presentation. As in real life, as for type 2 diabetes, a number of situations, problems, or even dilemmas, evaluations varies according to different viewing angles. And especially the definition and use of bariatric metabolic surgery or metabolic diabetic surgery. This has superlative implications and it is quite an old current and perhaps future dystopian reality that uh, what has been done during the last years is bariatric surgery in morbidly obese diabetics and not metabolic surgery in diabetics patients regardless of the weight. Yes, we still have metabolic surgery indexed to BMI to the 20% morbidly obese diabetics. On the other hand, in the last 18 years, since 2003, I have adopted the precept of surgery for the treatment of type 2 diabetes, including normal weight and overweight diabetic patients. Uh, the suggested topic of this presentation involves two questions. Is a non-obese diabetic patient a good candidate for metabolic diabetic surgery? And second, is helio interposition a viable option? The technique is the same since its description back in 2003 and involves a tailored to BMI sleeve gastrectomy and an adjusted to the total length of small bowel duodeno ileo interposition. It is a quite difficult operation and has been done through the laparoscope, through open surgery, hybrid, and even using robotics. A better insight into the pathophysiology have led to tailored diagnostic tools and, thera and therapies, which have dramatically improved outcomes. Altogether, those patients who do not get diabetic diabetes remission after surgery have a number of pathophysiologic characteristics like a prediabetes, a phenotype of impaired fasting glucose. So a potential new target for surgery would be unsolved hepatic glucose production and uptake and also hepatic lipid metabolism. With this background, we decided to add a selective intra-abdominal denervation. The primary goal is to perform a selective intra-abdominal sympathectomy, which involves, as the pictures clearly seen, the very first one on the left side, a bilateral splanchnisectomy close to the hiatus, and the second one, a sympathectomy denervation along the hepatic artery, trying to preserve, as in the third picture, the parasympathetic nerves that lies close to the portal vein and gastroduodenal artery, as pointed by the white arrows. In conclusion, technically, it is a challenging operation. Consequent to the choice of treating diabetes regardless of preoperative weight, the typical patient has exuberant macro and microvascular disease. Most patients is categorized as having high to very high cardiovascular risk, have a mean BMI around 28, 29, and have more than 10 years of diabetes. Hypertension and dyslipidemia are present in over 70% of patients, and coronary artery disease, retinopathy, nephropathy in nearly a third of patients. Insulin therapy was used by 50% of patients. In summary, a very diseased patient. As primary endpoints, we evaluated 30-day mortality, which is, about, which is around 0.4%. And also a group of more than 400 patients were re-evaluated after 10 years of surgery. 
and long-term mortality is 2.16%. We also evaluated 30-day morbidity, which is 6.4%, with a reoperation rate of 1.7 and readmission to the hospital of 4%. After 10 years, very few patients have surgical related complications, 2.52%, but the list of clinical problems is quite long, with GERD being observed in 16% of patients. At five years, A1C control without medications is achieved by nearly 80% of patients, as demonstrated in by this publication with this publication of 2011. And more recently, it's still unpublished, the operation stands the test of time. With a follow-up of more than 10 years, over 60% of patients were still in remission without any anti-diabetic medication. Over 10 years of follow-up demonstrated that a group of almost 20% of the patients is no longer under remission. Searching for reasons, we found that small bowel gets inflamed in this particular group of diabetics. At five years, we evaluated risk factors and found that microalbuminuria is under control, was under control in 75% of the patients, weight control around BMI in 93% of the patients, blood pressure control in 89% of the patients, and dyslipidemia remission in 84 to 86% of the patients. Over 10 years of follow-up, the operation stands the test of time with the control of the same risk factors nearly the same. It is also clear that at the long-term follow-up that a number of restrictions to or to indications of the surgery should be imposed, including the recognition that those with EGFR between 30 to 4, although under glucose control, will have end-stage renal disease in almost 80% of the patients. In collaboration with the University of Pisa, we studied potential mechanisms involved with the surgery and found that those diabetics with normal weight, overweight in green, and obesity with BMI 30 to 35 in red, had the same A1C control after two years of surgery. And same A1C control applies to this group of normal weight, overweight, and obese class one, after 10 years of ileal interposition. We also found cardio, we also evaluated cardiovascular events, maces and expanded, expanded maces in those with and without atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. After 10 years, we found that surgery prevents cardiovascular death, non-fatal myocardial infection, hospitalization for heart failure, but not non-fatal stroke. Sorry. As primary endpoints also, we evaluated uh, this after 10 years, and found that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction was an important reason for cardiovascular death with no clear correlation with the level of A1C. We also found very low rates of non-fatal myocardial infection and enzyme clearly correlated to better A1C control and overall control of the key components of atherosclerotic cardiovascular risks. And again, in an expected elevated incidence of non-fatal stroke. Is ileal interposition a viable alternative? 
Well, in this long-term study from the University of Milan, diabetic patients had ileal interposition compared to clinical treatment. At five years, nearly 70% of the patients after surgery had A1C below six and normal fasting glycemia. According to this prospective randomized study that compared bypass to ileal interposition in class one obese diabetic patients, diabetic remission was achieved by 30% of those in the bypass group while 75% in the ileal interposition group had diabetics, diabetic remission. We also have to conclude that the literature in this field is still very limited. And briefly have to mention that ileal interposition is a legal operation according to the highest judicial court from Brazil. In conclusion, is diabetic metabolic surgery ready for prime time? I would say yes. Can a scalpel or a laparoscope be used as an alternative treatment for a non-obese diabetic patient? I would also say yes. Can ileal interposition be used as an alternative technique? Yes, again. Although I recognize that the real difficulty is not accepting new ideas, but escaping the old ones. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. De Paula. Uh, that's a fantastic talk. I have uh, a, a few questions. First one relates to, to the role of uh, intra-abdominal symptectomy as opposed to ileal interposition alone. Have you studied these two procedures separately in a prospective way and shown that adding the neurectomy really adds to the results? Or have you started with sympathectomy right away so that you can compare them? Another question, if I may, is uh, you, as you've very nicely shown, it's not, it's a complex procedure. And uh, to my knowledge, only a uh, few centers and surgeons in the world have adopted this technique. I know of a group in India, another one in Turkey. How do you explain so many groups are interested in this procedure, which, which looks very appalling if we look at your results? Dr. Audio, we cannot hear you. Can you just again check your voice? If that's, I don't know if you're on mute or something. We could hear Professor Michel Suter asking you a question, but we cannot hear your answer. Can you just increase your voice? Audio, can you? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello? Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you, yes. Uh, okay, okay, I'll take my yeah. phones off. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, the first question that uh, is that uh, when we look at that, our five-year results, we could see that we could clearly see that the phenotype of those that do not get remission is a typical phenotype of a prediabetes. Unfortunately, I did not have enough time to go into the, all the pathophysiology that uh, endorse or support the role of selective sympathectomy. And, uh, uh, but the, the conclusion or the background is that those that do not get into remission have a typical phenotype of impaired fasting glucose um, pattern. And so because of that, we decided uh, and we could clearly see that we had problem, uh, problems that were unsolved by the operation. And that means hepatic glucose production and uptake. And secondly, uh, hepatic lipid met metabolism. Because of these uh, pathophysiologic events, we decided 
to go or to move further in the last years uh, to the selective intra-abdominal sympatectomy. Selective intra-abdominal sympatectomy has been studied in three different clinical trials in three different uh, universities in Brazil. And the data that we were able to get on the last years is that it has made a lot of change. So the results are very clearly better in terms of long-standing glucose control and also in relation to the lipid metabolism. Unfortunately, as you asked uh, for about that, we do not have a prospective control trial comparing those patients with uh, selective uh, denervation or selective sympatectomy and those without sym selective sympatectomy. So this is a, we still do not know if uh, on prospective randomized control trial, uh, what would be the power or how much this uh, selective intra-abdominal sympatectomy will make things better. But what I can tell you is that when we compared in, uh, ileal interposition with selective intra-abdominal sympatectomy and those without selective intra-sympatectomy, abdominal sympatectomy, there, and there is a clinical trial that is being made in Rio de Janeiro clearly show that when we add selective sympatectomy, we do better in terms of glucose control, lipid metabolisms, and patterns of uh, uh, NASH resolution or remission. In, uh, in, in relation to your second question, I think that, uh, you know, non-obese uh, diabetics is really the, the next step for metabolic surgery. And uh, I would endorse uh, Phil's um, uh, uh, mention that uh, we probably do better if we decrease the, the BMI step by step. Okay. Thank you for your answer. I have an, a small additional question. What additional morbidity is related to the sympathectomy? Did you happen to injure the, the hepatic artery, have a bleeding because of this portion of the procedure or not? Uh, what these three clinical trials have clearly demonstrated, Michelle, is that uh, there is no, uh, uh, no other uh, morbidity specifically related to this operation, but that is probably a risk for sure. All, all, you know, all different three things that you mentioned in terms of vascular lesions and et cetera are possible candidates for major morbidity related to this, uh, this new step. But until now, what is being shown on these three clinical trials is that we do not have this, uh, you know, this new uh, morbidity closely related to the operation. Thank you. Are there additional questions to our Rio from the, from the panel? David, Calvin. If no, it's probably time to move to the next presentation. I have no questions. You already asked the one I was going to ask. Go ahead. Dr. Cummings, go ahead and ask your question to Aurea. No, I, I, I said I have no questions because he already asked it. I was curious why it wasn't more widely okay. done. I think it's a very okay. difficult operation. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, we, uh, we are moving now towards our next uh, presentation. And uh, that's it's my honor to invite Professor Francesco Rubino. Uh, I've already introduced Francesco as a, you know, one of the pioneers here in the field of metabolic surgery. Somebody who is responsible, I would say, Obviously, alongside uh, uh, Oreo, Professor Higa, and Phil Shaw to bring metabolic surgery in the algorithm for treatment of type 2 diabetes. Uh, uh, it's an honor to introduce him. He's a chair of metabolic bariatric surgery at the King's College in London and uh, the Congress director for the first and the second uh, interventional therapy for type 2 diabetes and the DSS summit. Uh, Professor Rubino is going to speak on a very important topic that is the surgical treatment of type 2 diabetes, the indications and the outcome. Over to you, Professor Rubino. Mm -hmm. 
much. Well, thank you very much. Can you just uh, confirm that you can see my slides because I'm going live? Very nice. We can hear you very clearly. Uh, your beautiful voice and your slides are all, all nicely visible. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, uh, you know, I want to thank the organizers in general of, of the event, uh, also particularly uh, Mohit and, uh, and Mal Fobi for inviting me. But I also want to congratulate you guys because um, you have a, a spectacular faculty and it's a great honor for me to be part of this um, panel, really, with uh, pioneers in this field. Um, so uh, I, I'll try to um, focus my message on the uh, specific outcomes of surgical treatment of type 2 diabetes. But to do so, I have to uh, explain that there is such a thing, indeed, as a surgical treatment of diabetes as a distinct um, field, distinct discipline, a, a, a bit very contiguous uh, with the field of bariatric surgery. So bariatric surgery, as uh, many studies have shown, and I'm here just projecting the major uh, 20 years uh, data from the SOS study, bariatric surgery has been developed as a weight loss intervention. And as a weight loss intervention, it works spectacularly well. It creates a, you know, sustained weight loss for many, many years. So it is a weight loss intervention, no doubt about it. And there is benefit from weight loss. But bariatric surgery also has been shown to improve a number of conditions associated with obesity, most importantly, type 2 diabetes. Now, to me, the degree of uh, efficacy on diabetes the rapidity of the efficacy in diabetes, but the degree of efficacy uh, was something really remarkable. Uh, early on, when I was not yet uh, even considering developing a career in bariatric surgery, to me, it was a striking observation, the fact that you have up to 80% or more reported levels of complete resolution of a disease such as type 2 diabetes. That is not something you would expect from an operation that causes weight loss uh, or, or any intervention that causes weight loss and then improves diabetes secondarily as a side effect, uh, uh, if you wish, of the weight loss. So I really, uh, early on, I mean, from those very uh, simple observations of diabetes improving rapidly and radically, I asked myself whether this uh, was really weight loss surgery, or actually was weight loss surgery, but whether it could also be something else. Uh, actually surgical treatment for diabetes because the effect was so radical. Just to give you a sense of um, what, um, you know, it really, at least I find very striking, is um, and, uh, the results of the, of the very recent audit of few few weeks ago that I had um, done with my fellows here in, in London uh, on my NHS patients. And we just looked for other reasons as well uh, to the last 600 procedures in my own private practice, uh, sorry, a uh, public practice at the NHS. And uh, I've looked at, we looked at the um, uh, outcomes in terms of resolution of the disease or the main disease that these patients had uh, at baseline. And so we did identify remission of obesity as a reduction of BMI below the threshold at which normally obesity is um, um, classified as such. Uh, or remission of diabetes when the A1C reduces below 6.5, which is also the diagnostic criteria for diabetes. So we're using diagnostic criteria for obesity and, di and, and, and for diabetes, existing diagnostic criteria, and then look how many patients of this, ones that, of this group that we just audited have reached remission of obesity or remission of diabetes. And look at what happens when you really look at the results. So here are the same type of operations uh, and they can induce remission of the hepatitis in over almost 80% of cases, but only in 14% of cases, they induce remission of obesity, if you want to consider the obesity as it's defined today. Now, why I'm saying this? Because strikingly, obviously, uh, here is a, an op, you know, a, baseline, a basic observation. There is a, a set of procedures that are extraordinarily effective at inducing weight loss, and it's absolutely beneficial, but they're even more effective are causing, are treating diabetes. So if we call them bariatric or weight loss surgery, these operations, why we should not call them something else? Why we should not call them diabetes surgery or metabolic surgery, if you wish? 
And so with that in mind, I mean, over the uh, many years ago, I was uh, very convinced that this is a huge opportunity to treat potentially cure diabetes, uh, but an opportunity that, as, as Auro uh, said, was challenging uh, conventional wisdom about uh, diabetes and the conventional um, narrative around obesity, et cetera, et cetera, because there isn't such a thing as diabetes being an operable, um, let alone an intestinal disease. So in order to not only advance the science, but also change mindsets. We have organized this uh, series of uh, um, consensus conference called Diabetes Surgery Summit. Uh, and we've done that uh, in, by engaging uh, the medical community, the non-surgical community, as uh, Mohit said before, and also by uh, kind of linking and lising with the uh, professional organizations of, across the aisle, of surgical and non-surgical, the major ones. And I, uh, you know, we, we try to engage also the leading diabetes experts from around the world, and even people who had no interest or maybe that were openly against surgery at the beginning, but many of them, to their credit, have changed their mind as the data have started to support this idea of surgical treatment. And as I was uh, shown before, you can see that uh, the observation that uh, interventions on the gut can improve diabetes um, have been published for almost a hundred years. You have you know, re reports dating back to the 1920s where gastrectomies were reported to improve diabetes. And then in the 70s, bariatric surgery reported to induce diabetes remission. In the 90s, the toporious um, papers, fantastic papers detailing these effects and so on and so forth. But it was only around the last decade or so that with, I, I suspect, two uh, major um, changes in, in mentality, things have started to, to change a little bit in terms of defining this as a surgical treatment for diabetes itself. One was the recognition from animal and human studies now that, that there are in, mechanisms of surgery are independent on weight loss in many cases uh, and in many ways. Um, and also that, uh, again, the engagement of the uh, broader community of medical specialists, not just the surgeons, uh, has really resulted in the recognition of, of surgical treatment for diabetes now uh, in, uh, in many um, different media, um, scientific media, scientific um, circles, etc. Now, if this slide could just symbolically address the question of this meeting, uh, is surgical treatment of diabetes ready for prime time? I would say yes. The answer is yes. As you can see, major covers in major medical scientific journals have been given, dedicated to uh, surgical treatment for diabetes. What are the outcomes? I will not go into the details of the review of the uh, evidence because uh, clinical outcomes have been described by my by the previous speakers. Uh, just to say that there are at least uh, more than a dozen now uh, randomized clinical trials su showing superiority of surgery compared to medical therapy of diabetes uh, for all kind of clinical outcomes considered. Of course, not just remission, but also beyond. Uh, and that that's true, importantly for the uh, uh, subcontinent as well, not only for patients with BMI very high, above 35, but also below 35. Many of these uh, randomized trials did include patients with BMI below 35. Uh, recently, we published uh, the 10 years, uh, for the first time, this is the, the this paper is, uh, is about 10 years follow-up of one of those uh, randomized trials that um, you saw summarized in that slide. Uh, this is a, a trial that Professor Mingroni and myself uh, have uh, started and conducted in Rome. Uh, Joltrude Mingroni is continuing to work in Rome where she has done a lot of work to continue to follow up these patients and is a testament to her resilience really to man as she was able to maintain the patients in the study and we could uh, analyze their 10 years follow up with an extraordinary retention rate and 95% um, at 10 years, uh, including 100% of the surgical patients. The surgical patients in this group underwent either biliopancreatic diversion or ruin y gastro bypass and then were compared to medical therapy. And importantly, all patients by design in this study had advanced diabetes. All 50% of them were on insulin. They have all had more than five years uh, history of diabetes. And, um, and so they were patients with advanced diabetes. The primary endpoint was remission of diabetes. 
uh, include define as normalization of uh, um, di A1C below diabetic threshold of 6.5, and then we looked at secondary endpoints uh, of all sorts, as you can imagine. Now, obviously, the study showed superiority of surgery in terms of remission. There was a sustained remission in almost 40% uh, uh, of cases of uh, operated uh, of patients that were operated, no patients who had uh, medical treatment experienced remission at any time, and there was a slight superiority. Uh, statistically not significant, but certainly evident of biliopancreatic diversion compared to gastric bypass in maintaining remission over 10 years. Importantly, remission is not just the uh, main outcomes of surgery. We have uh, across the board a superiority of surgery in terms of glycemic control, reduction of A1C levels from baseline, medication usage. This is important because patients were, as you can see, on multiple medications at baseline. The medical therapy group um, actually increased medication usage over time, as you would expect, and uh, the patients who had surgery really made very limited, if any, use of medications across the 10 years, including insulin. 50% of uh, people uh, used in insulin at baseline. Very, very few, if any, uh, used uh, insulin after surgery, 10 years after surgery. This is a remarkable effect and that has implications for cost effectiveness. Um, medication reduction is also true not only for diabetes medication, but for other medications that are used in these patients to treat cardiometabolic conditions like dyslipidemia or hypertension. Importantly, despite the study was small, we found a dramatic difference in incidence of new diabetes complications in these patients with the medical group experiencing, as you would expect, uh, the progression of disease and complications of diabetes, both um, cardio, um, cardiac complication and other complications, despite of the fact that they're, you know, they were on multiple meds and to some extent with relatively good control of glycemia in their group, but diabetes still harms. Uh, no matter what, and you can see from that 72% uh, incidence of complications versus only 5% incidence in the two surgical groups uh, combined. So that's a remarkable effect. Surgery also resulted in better quality of life. I want to just summarize the study to say that um, because of the importance of this data, The Lancet, uh, a surgical, certainly not a surgical journal, and in the past actually a journal that has been very critical of surgical research. Uh, they um, famously or infamously published an editorial many years ago that defined surgical research as comic opera. So certainly not a, a journal that is historically being a friend, friendly to surgery, but look at what they did based on the results of these trials and probably also the background of the many other trials that over the years have been published. They said metabolic surgery, this is in their cover, um, is more effective than conventional medical therapy in the long-term control of type 2 diabetes, period. I mean, this is a statement from a, a non-medical, non-surgical journal, and I think it's uh, a test to the quality of data now. Um, as David has uh, presented before, there is a um, specific effect on mortality reduction in patients with diabetes. This is a major uh, meta-analysis that has shown the mortality reduction is twice as much as high in uh, patients with diabetes compared to patients without diabetes. And, and yet we call it, many of us continue to call it bariatric surgery. I do insist this is really about diabetes uh, for the patients who have it and the surgical treatment of diabetes is important because uh, it changes the everything, uh, you know, changing the indication from obesity to diabetes. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't operate for obesity. I'm saying that we should also recognize diabetes as an indication, changes a number of things. The outcomes of, as you see, a different mortality reduction, twice as much, just to give an, uh, an example. Patients' motives for surgery also change their demographics, the criteria for surgical indications. On one slide only, I want to say what the surgical indications are today based on global guidelines recognized by over 56 diabetes organizations from around the world, including organizations in India. And uh, this, these guidelines have started, but not yet com uh, completely achieved, uh, a pro process of transformation of criteria by going from simple weight-centric criteria of BMI above or below certain thresholds to a more nuanced approach where you put uh, things like control of glycemia being achieved or not by medications in, uh, in con in, um, along with uh, levels of uh, thresholds for BMI. With BMI is still in there, but we have it reduced it to 30 for people of Western uh, uh, Caucasian uh, ethnicity. And then we say that we should reduce it by 2.5 
um, units in patients with uh, for ovation descent. So in other words, patients with BMI as low as 27.5 are already uh, potentially candidates for uh, surgical indications for diabetes uh, according to these global guidelines. But I want to announce here that I do believe personally, and I think many have already said it in this program uh, before, that uh, we need to go beyond these guidelines and, and as soon as possible, because what we see time and again is that BMI thresholds for the same risk of obesity are, are of diabetes are different in different ethnic groups with patients from the um, subcontinent and other areas of Southeast Asia having a much uh, the same risk of from diabetes than people um, of other ethnicities at much, much lower BMI levels. And this 2.5 reduction units is not enough to actually take into account this real difference. So I would like to, uh, I, I hope I can speak also on behalf of the other organizers of the Diabetes Surgery Summit, but we will. We'll definitely will um, try to engage and um, uh, organize a, a new edition to really address the issue of surgical indications in the um, Asian, this, um, um, Asian continent uh, and, the, and in India in particular. Uh, finally, I want to say that despite these benefits, less than 1% in most countries of patients who meet the criteria have access to surgery. The reasons for these barriers are multiple. I would just say to conclude my presentation that unfortunately stigma of obesity and weight bias can play a major role. These are the conclusions of a major international consensus conference that we published last year in Nature Medicine uh, and that says that uh, stigma of obesity is a barrier to access in many ways because it does not it makes people not come forward patients do not seek and they don't receive appropriate care including surgery but also there are many roadblocks in access to surgery including policies insurance policies that are uh, indefensible according to the group and ethically objectionable uh, and that needs to be addressed i think moving forward and starting to say this is an intervention for diabetes is in part addressing the issue of weight bias and it's one more reason why we should call it as it is metabolic surgery for diabetes but we definitely need to address the broader issue of weight stigma and misconceptions if we want to see progress i want to invite all of you to uh, go to a www pledge to end obesity stigma.org and sign, sign the petition the petition sign the pledge that we have um, and we will that we hope to transform in a petition that has been already signed by professional organizations hospitals uh, scientific journals and many others more than 600 because we need to tackle stigma and we need to change the narrative around obesity and type 2 diabetes if we want to improve access to this and i thank you again for the opportunity to present thank you very much for your invite okay uh, great uh, professor rubino do we have uh, dr sachin chittawa to ask some questions to dr rubino a uh, very lucid lecture dr francisco rubino first of all i will congratulate you for renaming metabolic surgery to as diabetes surgery so my question is uh, pertaining to this only uh, how do you place uh, this diabetic surgery in bmi less than 30 as per the conventional algorithm second uh, i would like to know how it helps in cases of diabetes less than 30 BMI with respect to remission, because in our Indian setting in Southeast Asia, majority of our patients, there are a good number of our patients who are actually deficient in insulin secretion. So how do you think the surgery is going to be placed with respect to remission when BMI is less than 30? Because most of the lean ones, they are insulin deficient. Yeah, very good questions. So first of all, I think um, we need, unfortunately, for some time to play with BMI until um, we have more nuanced studies that allow us to, re to, to find alternative uh, criteria that more effectively than BMI can predict outcomes or also um, even more that criteria that can predict uh, progression of the disease to start with. We don't have to only think about how, how much surgery is likely to affect the disease, but also how much the patient is likely to suffer or die as a, as a consequence of the disease. And that has to be computed in the criteria that uh, forms the indication for surgery. So I, my hope is that we will get rid of BMI altogether at some point. It's really 
and nonsensical in so many ways. Not a clinical parameter, it's an epidemiological parameter. It should have never been used, but it has been used. And unfortunately, we, it was going to stick there for quite some time. But we will get there at some point. But we have to do that step by step because unfortunately, the damage is done. BMI is in there. So we need to create new clinical studies with more nuanced outcomes and predictive factors in order to completely replace it. In terms of BMI below 35, 30, Yes, you're right. There are patients with there, many more than BMI above 30, with uh, insulin deficiency. But we should not, and, and remission for and in those patients may be less likely to occur. No question. But remission is not the only uh, outcome of surgery. As I mentioned to you, uh, you want to reduce cardiovascular risk, reduce complications, etc. So whether or not you achieve remission, there are still way many more benefits that are still feasible. And so we shouldn't la judge just based on the likelihood of remission. And finally, I want to say that many of, many of us, initially, our is here, and you know, when this thing, uh, this uh, movement started, we were concerned about the less than 80% remission rates in patients with low BMI. We saw figures such 40, 50%. But now that we are operating even in higher BMI for the intent to treat diabetes. And we see coming forward a population with more advanced disease, you see those 40, 50% figures of remission also in the high BMI population. So it's not a unique issue of the low BMI. It's just a matter of the fact that if you operate on more se severe cases, you're going to get less remission rates across the board of BMI. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco, for your answers. And obviously, a very lucid lecture. Everybody was looking forward to it. And as we set our expectations, uh, we got what we wanted. Now, uh, we are moving to the last session, and that's the life surgery session. And as we uh, decided that this is going to be a one anastomosis gastric bypass, it's a short procedure. Uh, we have already put the ports in. Uh, Although this patient is, uh, I'll just briefly give the history. I would invite uh, all the panelists, including Dr. Higa, Michelle Suter, I think Phil Shower can join us, Dr. Cummings, uh, Francisco, and uh, all others to join us for this case. And if they have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer. Here we have a 117 kgs male with a BMI of 43 uh, with very severe diabetes mostly on insulin and oral hypoglycemic agents. And the insulin is around 150 units. Uh, and despite that sort of insulin, this diabetes is not controlled. Uh, patient already has microvascular disease. He has uh, uh, retinopathy, which has been diagnosed grade one. He has started to have proteins uh, and microalbumin, microalbuminuria. He has one stent in his left LAD. So we have all the uh, microvascular complications uh, which are here. And I'm talking about this procedure, one anastomosis gastric bypass for type two diabetes and weight loss, but primarily for type two diabetes, which is the intention of this gentleman. So let's first focus on the, uh, just needless to mention, this patient has undergone COVID-19 testing as per the protocol and has been ruled out and declared fit for the surgery. Now, if I may focus on the port position, so I'm standing on the right side of the patient uh, we usually work with five ports. This is the optical port just above the umbilicus. We have two 12 mm ports on each side of the optical port in the anterior axillary line. Uh, we have two 5 mm ports, two finger breads below the right and the left infraclavicular area or the subcostal angle uh, for me and my assistant. And I'll be standing on the right side of the patient. Uh, we are using a 2 mm two to three mm of a non-scarring needloscopic instrument to retract this liver. So that's, that's the port position which we have. Uh, the upper GI endoscopy uh, does not suggest GERD or hiatus hernia, which precludes this patient to have a one anastomosis. As a first step towards the one anastomosis, uh, we make a space here. Uh, I should tell you that one anastomosis is a very short procedure. Uh, and, and that's what we hear because uh, our data suggests that it takes half the time as compared to a Ruvai gastric bypass. Uh, it's good for diabetics like this who have a stent in C2 and uh, we want a quick procedure. We want to go ahead and do something uh, better for this patient here. Uh, also, you know, uh, uh, the interesting question would be what sort of length we're gonna bypass here? Uh, what, what's our criteria to choose this particular patient? 
and how we decide at a center where we do all these three uh, procedures, the sleeve, uh, the conventional Ruevi gastric bypass and the one anastomosis, why we have chosen a one anastomosis here to treat diabetes of this particular patient. So before I, I come to all those questions, I would first focus more on the important steps. So as you can see that we have already entered into the lesser sac uh, here. Uh, this is very bad visceral fat. And you can see posterior wall of the stomach also has the same kind of fat. Uh, so I'm using uh, here energy source, mostly on the coagulation mode. Uh, uh, as surgeons, we have all discussed that a one anastomosis here uh, is a long pouch. Uh, and that's the benefit uh, of doing it uh, here. So this is a pretty long pouch. And as you can see, the first fire comes uh, just below the incisura. Uh, and that's a green load. We can use a black here, whatever suits. I, I feel that this is a relatively thicker area of the stomach when you approach it from the uh, left side from the lesser curvature. And that, that's thickness, which is responsible for us uh, for using uh, a green load. Uh, the next all loads can be purple if you're using a Medtronic. And uh, so as you can see that this is a good amount of uh, antrum being taken. The distance from the pylorus is around 2.5 centimeters. So that's the pylorus there. That's the first part of the duodenum. And uh, what we can demonstrate it, it's a pretty long uh, pouch. Uh, the effort is made to make a pretty long pouch. So that's, that's around 2.5 to 3 centimeters from the pylorus. And, uh, that's what is the intention uh, is that this uh, length should be, you know, as good as 18 centimeters. Now, if we talk about a sleeve only variant of, uh, oh, sorry, uh, diabetes only variant of the one anastomosis, uh, at most times we keep a 38 trench uh, bougie, but we may make pouch larger than that. So it's a pretty large pouch, uh, you know, the breadth and the, 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 the breadth and the width of that particular pouch uh, can be a bit more, uh, you know, than, than the conventional. So uh, we are not here giving any, any sort of uh, restriction to this pouch, uh, but instead we are more interested in, in, in making a long tube, which is not very narrow, which is, you know, uh, just uh, good enough. The, the length of that tube, which we aim here in the diabetes only variation of one anastomosis is around 18 to 20 centimeters as previously mentioned. And the breadth is around 2.5 to 3 centimeters. So uh, we use a 38 French tube here to calibrate this uh, pouch, but mostly that is to maintain the patency. We are not very, uh, you know, particular about measuring that kind of length for this pouch. As I said, our measurement is more by the ruler scale. It's more of a length of around 18 to 20 and a breadth of around 2.5 to 3 centimeters. And once I make this tube completely, I'm going to demonstrate. So tube is a very rough thing just to maintain the patency there, uh, not exactly determining the kind of uh, uh, pouch uh, we're going to make or not exactly determining the volume of our pouch. So uh, that's the area of the uh, angle of his and my uh, a usual way of dealing with this area is without using too much of energy source. So you can see that I just go there with my grasper and, you know, just make a little bit of space there with grasper, with the blunt grasper, not using too much of energy source. We never use it at that area. But I think that that's the uh, critical area where I can cause some injury uh, with the harmonic shear. So I just, just try and avoid it. And we go there and we try and remove all this momentum back. And most times I'm able to come, uh, uh, through this area without, you know, causing too much of damage to the G junction or using any energy source. Now, once this particular pouch is made, I'm going to use a ruler to measure the length for you. As I said, uh, this is the G junction. So this is around uh, 10 centimeters uh, till here. Uh, so if we see this, uh, that's around 10 centimeters here. Uh, and then we're going to measure a length over a 38 French bougie completely pushed in. So that's another 17 to 18. So, so it's an 18 centimeter pouch. Uh, this is the longest we can make uh, with a, and this is being measured on a stretched uh, bougie here. So uh, that's the length. And if you see the breadth of this pouch, so that's not a 38 French bougie 
pouch. It's it's more. It's like forty or forty five, forty two or forty three or forty five French. But you know, it's uniformly two point five to three centimeters everywhere. So that that's the sort of uh, breadth we are looking at. Now at this stage, I'm going to make a gastrotomy. Uh, usually, a posterior gastrotomy is what we make. Uh, this patient has some fat on this particular pouch, so I I. I would remove this fat because once we fire a, a cartridge here, the length has to go up and plus it costs some oozing there. Uh, so I, I usually prefer to just do some hemostasis and remove this fat. Uh, once we remove this fat, we make a gastrotomy and gastrotomy is uh, primarily made on this end of the pouch. Uh, so as uh, to, you know, uh, uh, get the blue of the bougie visible. And once we have done that, we just start to count. Now, a very important discussion about the limb lens here. So you can see this, this momentum is much inflamed. So it's very heavy. It's much inflamed as compared to most other uh, 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 momentums, which we would see in a non-diabetic. It's very inflamed with a lot of mesentric fat here. Now that's the inferior mesentric vein we can see. And this is the ligament of trides. So I'm using a, I can use a ruler scale, but I have a grasper. You can see that's marked. So I'm using this grasper to measure the length. So this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, 160, 170, and 180. So we standardized and published this uh, uh, technical standards uh, in the meeting and we published in obesity surgery about 32 procedures. Out of them, we got the consensus that 180 to 200 centimeters should be the length of the small bowel in the diabetes only variant of one anastomosis. And the moment you go above 200 centimeters, uh, of bypass and one anastomosis, one should count the entire length of the bubble. So most of the experts of mini gastric bypass uh, voted on the fact that if you have a limb length less than uh, 200 centimeters in combination, there is no need to measure the common channel. And that's what we are sticking to. If I would have gone above, uh, push the bougie, if I would have gone above uh, 200 here, I would have measured the length of the common channel completely. So uh, that's why we are not measuring the complete bowel because we stick to 180, which is obviously less than 200 centimeters. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a posterior anastomosis. So uh, uh, I would use the entire length of my cartridge uh, to make this uh, anastomosis. Uh, at most times, uh, we end up having around 4 to 4.5 after we have done with our closure. So this is uh, simple and straightforward here. Uh, we can see this anastomosis uh, done at 180 centimeters from the ligament. We have not counted the common channel because uh, for most studies, we know that this would be at least uh, 300 to 350 centimeters from our own data. So uh, almost 5,600, some one anastomosis gastric bypass done at our center. And uh, we had, no incidence of a short bowel syndrome by keeping the limb lengths less than 180 centimeters, uh, to 180 centimeters less than 200, pardon me. And there's no need to calculate the common channel if, if the total length is uh, that way. And this data also is confirmed by our gastric bypasses where if we are going for a higher BP uh, limbs in our gastric bypasses, but the entire length of rule limb plus BP limb is less than 200 centimeters, we never count the common channel even there. So that's that's a principle uh, we have set uh, 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 getting uh, reflection from our own data in terms of 
you know, having complications uh, of causing bowel entrotmies, uh, damage to the bowel uh, by measuring the entire limb lens uh, versus uh, gaining uh, something substantial in terms of uh, uh, counting the entire bowel length. Uh, because uh, ir irrespective of uh, whatever we do, whenever we were less than 200 centimeters, this common channel was always more than 400 centimeters. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the technique we have been using. I, I think that's the same technique maybe uh, uh, most surgeons who have been trained by Phil Shower use, uh, you know, securing one of the ends uh, of the entrotomy, gastrotomy complex at the caudal end and then coming to the kefilat. Uh, although they may be taking four layers, we do it in a single layer. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. So this is the caudal end which I secured and now I come to the kefilad end. Uh, uh, so I know that I've gone beyond my uh, gastrotomy and trotomy complex. Um, so uh, that's the uh, uh, stay suture and then you know we can uh, use this uh, thick staple line here to cover the anastomosis that gives a little bit more security because of the uh, sturdiness of this staple line and uh, uh, as this is a posterior anastomosis i can use this uh, to uh, incorporate in my uh, suturing uh, at the same time as you can see there is a little bit of fat which is attached to this particular uh, stomach, which we removed as much as possible because we never wanted to go a length higher in terms of the thickness of the cartridge. Uh, we're using a purple tri-staple, which is a little bit too much for the uh, small bubble at 180 centimeters. We all have been using the tans in our gastric bypass. So it, it, it makes sense to you know restrict to the purples here if, if we are going ahead with a Medtronic uh, set. Uh, or maybe a blues if we use any other uh, 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 company. So uh, the intention here is that uh, we would not want to cause more bleeding by using a higher thickness length, but rather remove the fat from the stomach uh, to decrease the size of the cartridge. Now that's uh, the stitch coming from the kefila to the caudal end. And that's what we have done. We have completely closed it. Uh, so this is the one anastomosis diabetes variant, 180 centimeters of limb length from the duodenal jejunal flexure, 18 centimeters of pouch in length, 2.5 to 3 centimeters in breadth. And now I'll put in an endoscope to show you the afferent and the efferent loop. Uh, we do intraoperative endoscopy just to check the potency and bleeding inside and also to teach the fellows about the anatomy. Uh, I would use one or two clips close to the G junction, but at most times I realize that we put a gauze there and once we return back, uh, some oozing would have stopped uh, and we need not use sutures or, or clips. Uh, but nevertheless, we'll do some hemostasis at the top uh, once we are done with the endoscopy. Uh, so can I have the endoscopic view? Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's the esophagus. I expect a little bit of ooze there inside the esophagus, which I often find because uh, uh, the patient's position, the blood from the stomach pouch can get inside. And that's the Z line. We have no esophagitis, as I previously informed. Uh, this is the staple line you can see. Uh, you know, this staple line has little bit of oozing, but it's the blood is completely clotted. So you can see that, you know, this all line looks good to me. There is no active oozing, which I find here. At the same time, this is a pretty wide anastomosis. And all of you can appreciate that the anastomosis also doesn't have a bleeding. So this is one loop where I enter inside, which is the efferent loop. So I can go there and I have my assistant blocking. And then this is the other loop here, which I want you to appreciate. And that's the afferent loop. So if I twist my scope, I can even go inside the afferent loop here. So that's my afferent loop. And if I go to this particular view, I can see both my efferent and my afferent loop. And that's my anastomosis. It looks good. I'm going to suck in all the air so that this is uh, causing no distension inside and I'm going to come out. So that's, that marks the end of the procedure. 
and uh, thank you very much if there are any questions from the uh, stellar panel we have i'll be grateful uh, and i would be you know answering them thank you so much Professor Cummings, Dr. Souter, if you have any questions on, on this particular procedure, I'll be more than happy to answer. I have one, Mohit. This is David. Uh, Can you unmute yourself? We can't hear you. Can't hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Yes. Okay. From the beginning of this procedure, as you well know, there's been a hot debate about whether it's going to be a problem to cause bile reflux. I was just curious to know if you have an updated view of how serious that risk is. So uh, as per uh, the algorithm we have, we rule out uh, prior reflux completely. And uh, I have never done this procedure on patients who have prior gastroesophageal reflux or even mildest of esophagitis or even a high dose hernia. Uh, there we, don't, we do not perform uh, a one anastomosis because there are chances that because these patients have uh, GERD or, or hired us, they might have a defective lower esophageal sphincter, which is not functioning properly for multiple reasons. And the bile from the pouch can get inside the lower end of the esophagus uh, with patient who can vomit bile and that, that can be seriously damaging and uh, potentially malignant. So we completely rule out GERD and we have done a preoperative endoscopy in this patient and ruled out the gastroesophageal reflux, esophagitis or hiatus completely. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mohit? Mohit. Yes, but I can your, hear you. Uh, uh, motility study in every patient to check the low esophageal sphincter. Pardon, can, can you repeat your question, please? Do you perform motility studies routinely to exclude the uh, uh, low? Uh, the so we are not performing uh, pH manometry. No, we don't do them routinely. But if there is a case of uh, GERD on history and we see esophagitis, in those cases, we refer them to the gastroenterology to do a pH manometry and completely rule out, uh, 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 you know, any type of reflux, uh, whether functional reflux or whether really physiologic or non-physiologic reflux. Thank you. May I have ask uh, another question? Yes, yes, absolutely. Deal, how do you deal with the mesenteric defect? Yes, yeah, so uh, we, uh, we, we have done almost, you know, taking this data together from cases done by me at my center and others, more than uh, 5,000 of one anastomosis. And we haven't closed the mesenteric defects, uh, the Peterson space uh, in, in all, all of them. Uh, the incidence of internal hernia in our series is uh, negligible. I'm no, not a single case in mini gastric bypass or one anastomosis. So we do not find any merits in uh, closing that defect. Uh, for reasons unknown, uh, if, if we see that defect, it's pretty large. So sometimes when we close it, uh, because one anastomosis gastric bypass patients have a lot of weight loss. Uh, we can create micro defects and create uh, nidus for uh, internal hernia. Uh, but this defect being large, uh, now it's very large. And once this patient will lose the kind of visceral fat, this becomes further large. And the chances of uh, him having a, an internal hernia is less. Uh, now, if we compare this to a Ruavai, the anatomy of Ruavai is a little different. Uh, and that I realized when I took photographs and measured that length. So the Peterson space in Rua Y is a little, uh, a little small as compared to this large space because uh, the bowel is coming up distally uh, than the Rua and Y and the mesentery is different than the Rua and Y. So that's, that's a configuration in one anastomosis where I don't know for reasons we haven't find and our, our own series. I mean, even others, very, very less incidence of internal hernia. So like most other MGB surgeons, we are not closing it. Okay, thank you. Can I, may I ask a question? 
Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. So first of all, I want to congratulate you. It was a great um, a demonstration, really um, very well done, um, very straightforward procedure. It makes a, um, you know, technical sense in the way you did it. Uh, just a question about, um, a little bit to elaborate more about the um, uh, potential for reflux in this procedure. Now, you know that uh, sleeve gastrectomy after many years is revealing a weak um, point in, in reflux. And, we do, uh, I personally do endoscopy in every single patient. We study all patients for reflux, for hiatal hernia and everything. But even when we we have no evidence of anything preoperatively, we still have some fair incidence of reflux, symptomatic reflux and dysphagia. Now, the sleeve that you perform um, is, um, in, in, at least as much as I can see, not necessary. It's not stricter. It could probably maintains even more acid producing stomach than a regular sleeve. Um, and so I think you're potentially prone to the same problem of reflux. If that happens, or if the patient have uh, dysphagia, with this, whatever mechanism the same as we have in sleeve gastrectomy, what is your revisional option uh, in a patient like this? Yes, yeah, so great question, Francisco. So I, like you said, I would endoscope all of my patients of mini gastric bypass or one anastomosis, one years, two years, three years. It's an yearly endoscopy, which I compulsorily do. And if we have uh, a symptomatic reflux where patients have come to us, if they have, you know, uh, very high grade of esophagitis or even Barrett's or some patients might vomit bile. Uh, these patients are uh, subject, if they, if, they, if they have an issue with bile reflux, uh, they are subjected to a diversion by brown anastomosis and a jejunogegnostomy at the lower end and we divert the bile. But if they have acid reflux, like you said, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation to deal with. Uh, and this acid reflux, which you said, would, would often happen with multiple marginal ulcers. Uh, and that situation we have often faced. So my, my personal, uh, uh, you know, choice of operation in all those cases would be converting this into a, a very, very short pouch, very small pouch, uh, Ruovi gastric bypass. Uh, uh, Dr. Phoebe and myself, we discussed, uh, we have also converted some of these cases where there's a lot of reflux uh, with multiple marginal ulcers uh, uh, to sleeves. But the problem is that converting these procedures to a sleeve uh, at the end of the day is going to give an anatomy with a very high compartment pressure and a distal pylorus, which can be obstructive. So if you, if you ask me the best procedure is a very short pouch, three to four centimeters of a conventional Ruovi gastric bypass with minimal peptic ulcer, peptic acid mass, uh, minimal uh, cells of acid producing cells and less chances of having that kind of reflux and uh, multiple marginal ulcers. Okay. Can I, can I just add another quant, uh, quick question? Yes, yes, yes. So you've done a lot of, uh, uh, of these procedures, uh, and I think you would be probably in the best uh, position to um, tell us and many others who, uh, what is the real difference between this procedure and the standard when why gas to bypass what is there maybe the primary reason why you would suggest to do this instead of Ruen Y? And what is perhaps the, the primary reason why you think you have concern and that Ruen Y might actually still be uh, a better procedure? Which patients might be still a better procedure? So Dr. Phoebe joined us in uh, 2016 and we sat and he saw my data that I was doing all three procedures, uh, but there was no rhyme and reason. So we devised an algorithm. And so your question is, uh, you know, very good in a sense that most young surgeons watching this will get a logic as to why we are choosing one anastomosis and why not a gastric bypass here. So I'll give you a very straightforward answer, which, which will make sense. So any patient who has history of GERD or established acid reflux or a hiatus hernia or an esophagitis or with mild to moderate liver disease or a patient who cannot come for a follow-up or somebody who cannot afford the cost of the supplements will never get a one anastomosis gastric bypass. So to us, established hiatus hernia or gastroesophageal reflux disease or moderate liver disease or lack of compliance to follow up, 
patient who live in far fetched areas or cannot afford supplements will not get a one anastomosis gastric bypass those would be the case uh, of a rovi gastric bypass so a girl in a hiatus hernia uh, with diabetes and mild liver disease is a very good indication for a rovi gastric bypass in fact in the present era of bariatric surgery of my generation the rovi gastric bypass is going to dwindle further with time and would remain the choice of operation only in patients with established gastroesophageal reflux disease esophagitis and hiatus hernia and rest all gets one anastomosis uh one anastomosis to me is a preferred choice because as you can see i did the entire procedure with my team in or 20 minutes the most uh time we have taken to do this procedure in high risk super super obese patients is 25 minutes uh even a patients of 400 kilos at our center which which we registered and documented in the registry is uh procedure performed on bed on 28 to 30 minutes so you know it's a short anesthesia time no defect closure simple anastomosis which is low lying close to the transverse colon uh the bowel is not under a lot of pressure or tension to be brought up near the esophagus is what makes is a procedure of choice and as i said how we decide between the two uh, that's how we decide between the two for young patients unmarried individuals individuals who have liver disease uh, you know somebody who uh, you know we have a lot of iron deficiency here in india and females and the average hemoglobin here in india in indian females around 9 to 11 all those are good candidates for sleeves thank you And logical thinking, Mohit. Thanks for explaining that. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, if there are no other questions, uh, I would like to end this session by thanking all of you on the panel: Dr. Cummings, Dr. Phil Shower, Kelvin, Francesco, Dr. Michel Suter, Dr. Sachin, and obviously Dr. Phoebe uh, for taking out this time and addressing this very, very important. a uh, topic of uh, the session of the episode of our virtual bariatric university uh, just for your information uh, uh, david and uh, francisco uh, this is uh, as per our database the most watched live session of virtual bariatric university as of now so congratulations to all of you 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 made it to the records and uh, uh, special thanks to oreo and uh, michel suter and phil uh for joining in alongside francisco and dr higa because your names are so big that you know all indian surgeons here are uh you know so grateful to all of you to have contributed to this science of uh diabetes and metabolic surgery we have had oreo couple of times in india to operate i have been trained by him to do these ileal interposition procedures we have had dr cummings here in india we had kelvin here but i think next time i'll have professor michel suter and francesco here in india at indore to host you and to have another big meeting with stalwarts like you thank you so very much for joining us and i hope to see you sometime soon uh, god permitting and this pandemic ends and we see you personally and physically thank you so much <laughs>